eternal rock of ages we appreciate what you are doing we thank you so much because of your great love and concern for our souls you died on the cross so that we will not go to hell we thank you so much because of your goodness mercy and long suffering thank you father for the gathering of today i know you are here with us be thou exalted in jesus name we pray O lord that you will visit every one of us afresh today that our lives shall be reformed and transformed that thy glory will come back again send us lord into your harvest so that we can become a brand new person indispensable tool in the hand of the almighty thank you father for the answer in jesus mighty name we pray amen shout hallelujah you can do better shout hallelujah you can do better shout hallelujah amen, amen. let's open our bibles to matthew chapter 9 the gospel according to saint matthew chapter 9 i'm going to read the last three verses 36 37 and 38 but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd then said he unto his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest this is our master our lord jesus christ giving us a prayer request pray therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth Libras into his harvest. I'm talking today on this phrase, but the Libras are few. But the Libras are few. Have you ever thought about this statement? The Libras are few. The pastors are many but the laborers are few the evangelists keep on multiplying but the laborers are few the apostles were daily on the increase superlative apostles senior apostles most senior apostles but the laborers are few the prophets are increasing on daily basis everybody wants to become a prophet but the laborers are few the missionaries are here but the laborers are few we have so many church workers so many members in the church and the churches but only the laborers are few who are these laborers and why are they needed and why are they so scarce 
these are our points of emphasis today. And after the message, you will check your own life. Am I one of the laborers that are few? Can God count on me? Can God depend on me? Can the Spirit of the Lord rely and rest on me? I'm going to divide the messages into three very important subtopics. But don't forget what brought the Lord Jesus Christ to say this statement. When he saw the multitudes, the Bible says he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And that is why he said the harvest truly is precious, but the laborers are few. Then pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. He is the only one who knows the laborers and where they are and he is the only one who can send these laborers into the harvest so that he will do so immediately. Brethren, let me talk to you on the plentifulness of the harvest. Then, point number two, I will talk on the fewness of the laborers. Then, point number three, I will talk to you on the perils of the lukewarm. One, the plentifulness of the harvest. Two, the fewness of the laborers. And three, the perils of the lukewarm. Point number one, the plentifulness of the harvest. From the world data, there are about nine billion people presently existing upon the planet earth the cosmological death rate is about 87 souls per second that is by world statistics 87 souls die within one second as you hear the ticks of the clock, souls are falling. And that means, if we follow this assertion, 5,220 people die within one minute worldwide. And what does that mean? Within one hour, 313,200 lives are lost. And within one day, 7 million, 516,800 souls are lost. What does that imply? Within a week, 52 million, 617,600 people die. And within a year, the death rate cosmologically has risen to 2 billion. Brethren, death spears no age, no status, and no sex. As aged people die, small children die also. And people all over the world die by various means. Some die through heart attacks. Some die through accidents. 
Some are swept away by the flood. Some people were electrocuted. One way or the other, people die. Only one life. And immediately the life is taken away. There is no remedy. Brethren, out of these people who die yearly, how many of them are really and properly born again? Demons and death are more serious than many of us. Death is so busy killing people on daily basis. The church is busy playing religion. The church is busy playing rituals, religious rites, Pentecostal emotionalism without any life. One man of God in his book, why revival tarries, says the tragedy of the hour is that there are so many dead preachers preaching so many dead sermons to so many dead people. Dead congregations, dead preachers, dead leaders, dead followers all over the world. And now think about the number of people who might have died within the last 10 years. How many of them were you able to reach? Brethren, about 9 billion people are presently alive on earth, like I said. Some people say that the Nigerian population is now about 150 million. And this is one of the nations in Africa. In West Africa alone, we have about 16 countries. What about North Africa? South Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa. And Africa is just one of the seven continents of the world. We still have hundreds of millions of people in the Asia, Australia, North and South America, and so on. Think about the number of ethnic groups who are yet unreached in the interior and riverine areas of Nigeria alone. There are more than 1,000 villages without a gospel church. There are more than 100 groups of people who don't have the Bible in their native language in Nigeria alone. Now think about it. The number of Muslims across this nation who don't believe in the Son of God. Think about 2 million of them who perform the holy pilgrimage every year. Think about the nominal Christians now playing religion in all our churches. Now think about the mega cities like Lagos and so on. And think about the sin, the idleness, and the perfection. Now come back to the Pentecostal circles and examine the number of people that are genuinely converted. Imagine even in Pentecostal circles, the worldliness, the profanity, the lukewarmness, the pollution, and the desecration of the sanctuary. Brethren, come now to the campuses and see the cultism and the occultic pandemonium, shameless and open indecency, homosexuality, Lesbianism, bestiality, rape, corruption, exploitation, seduction, pornography, and all other forms of antisocial, maladjusted, and animalistic tendencies. Brethren, there is no doubt about it. 
the harvest is precious. We have so many people to reach. And before we go further, have you been reached? Have you been comforted? And I want you to measure your own confession by the parameter of the word of God. Some confessions are sham. Some confessions are improper. Some confessions are inappropriate. And some confessions are just superficial. Shallow. They are not as genuine as they should be. And that is why before temptation, people fall. Examine your own life. Listen to me. The day that the Lord will come, there will be no mistake. He will not make a mistake of taking a sinner, no matter the littleness of the sin. No sinner will go. If there is a sinner among the choir, that person will not go. If there is a sin among the workers, God will not mind the degree of your works you have done for him. A sinner is a sinner, and we are rever. God finds sin, he will judge the sin. There are some pastors I know who will be left behind. I know that there are some ministers, evangelists. That's why I pray for myself that, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God, because of anything, because of anything, because everything here is mundane, everything here is a vemera, everything here doesn't have a lasting value. Because of anything, don't allow me to miss that day. And I know by the grace of God, you yourself will not miss that day. But we need to prepare because the Lord is coming. And He's coming at the hour we don't ever expect. And God is faithful. He has been patient for more than 2,000 years now. Jesus has been tiring. And the day is coming when He will tarry no longer. And that day is going to be a day of wrath. That day is going to be a day of divine visitation upon the world. Ah, that day is going to be a glorious day for the saints. No matter where you are, immediately the trumpet blows. Once you can hear the trumpet, you are already in the sky. And then there's going to be a magnet, a divine magnet that will pick you up. For we are wherever you are and take you to the very presence of the master. Now listen, if you miss that day because of anything, certificates, popularity, fame, money, or you have been exploited by the devil and you allow the devil to take away eternal life from you, and now you are cajoling yourself. Now you are pretending. You are behaving as if you are still a Christian. We are rash. You have lost every virtue concerning Christianity. That day, there will be no mistake. You will be left here to face the Antichrist. And to be included and to suffer during that great tribulation. I pray God forbid it for you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. I want us to read verse 13 and 14. Joel 3, 13 and 14. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come. Get you down, for the press is full. The facts overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, 
For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. That is why you need to prepare yourself. Please don't take anything for granted. Even now as I'm speaking, stop believing in yourself. Examine your experience. Is your experience biblical? Have you experienced genuine conversion? The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, that person is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Just examine yourself based on that single scripture. Were you saved? And are you saved? Listen. It is not a big deal to be saved. It doesn't cost much as far as you are concerned to be saved. But the problem is maintenance. Anything you have that you cannot maintain, you will soon lose it. And maintenance of Christian life is the hardest thing on earth. Because immediately you get born again, the devil will come. The moment you separate yourself from the devil and all the works of darkness you have been doing before, the devil will come. There's going to be a challenge. A challenge to your faith. There's going to be a persecution. There's going to be a trial. There's going to be a temptation. Daniel made up his mind in a strange land that he will never allow anybody to defile him by any means. If you don't make up that mind, that if you make up your mind that way, even there are some of you when you are at home, you are you are Christians. Some of you are very, very good Christians. Some of you are very, very spiritual people. But immediately you get to the campus and you see the new things and see the ways of life of the people because you cannot beat them. Some of you have joined them. And remember, if you join them, when they are perishing, you perish with them. My brethren, check up on your own life. I mean, by the yardstick of the scriptures, are you saved? Are you ready? Are you one of his own children? Or do you call yourself a child of God when heaven doesn't recognize you as one? Or is it your pastor or your leader or your counselor or your mentor giving you a courage giving you a counsel, telling you you are saved when you are not? Brethren, examine yourself before we go too far. Because I'm telling you that there are so many people in the world who are yet to be saved. And can you imagine Satan has many candidates in the churches? Are you not one of them? There are hypocrites in the churches. There are fornicators in the churches. There are seducers in the churches. There are tempters in the churches. There are people who have collaborated with the devil in the churches. Witches, wizards, necromancers, palmists, occultic people in the churches. All in the name of religion. The day the trumpet blows, there will be nowhere to hide. Check up on your own life. Now, let me go to the fewness of the laborers. Before the full discussion on the fullness, I mean, fewness of the laborers, 
I want us to examine the kind of people referred to as laborers in the Bible. This is because not every Christian is a laborer in the fine yard. Laborers are people. Let me give you seven descriptions of the people the Bible calls laborers. And do you know the essence of what I'm trying to tell you? What I'm trying to say is this. You cannot become a laborer when you are not comforted. Genuinely comforted. Appropriately comforted. You can't become a laborer. Now listen to me. Don't make a mistake. Wesley went to Bible school. And he spent so many years. He had degrees in theology. But one glorious day, he was in a vehicle with somebody sitting by his side. And that person was a minister of God too. Wesley also with a collar around his neck was sitting down beside that minister of the Lord with a big portfolio. And he was contented and fully satisfied. And the man asked him, Are you born again? Wesley said, Look at my portfolio. Uh -uh. By this portfolio, can't you see that I'm born again? The man asked again, I'm not asking you about portfolio. Are you born again? He said, Look at the collar around my neck. Can't you see that I'm a minister already? He said you can be a minister without the experience of salvation. Are you born again? Then Wesley opened his bag. And he took out a big Bible. Bigger than my own. And he said look at my Bible. As big as it is. And even bigger than your own, the man said, I'm not talking about the bigness of your Bible. Are you born again? Then, when he asked the question the seventh time, it dawned on Wesley that he was yet to be born again. After theology, after certificates, after so many years in the ministry, he was yet to be born again. Don't make an assertion. The assumption may be too costly for you. Are you born again? Forget about your gift. I'm talking about grace. Forget about who you are physically. I'm talking about who you are spiritually. Forget about your status, your background, your parents, how religious they are. You cannot inherit salvation. Are you born again? Or are you just deceiving yourself thinking that you are born again? Because God will not send you to this harvest without first of all saving you Whatever God will want to do through you, He will first of all do it in you. Before the Holy Spirit will lead you, He will correct you first. Before the Spirit will come upon you, He must come inside of you. Salvation must precede the anointing. And if you receive any unction and you are functioning in any office and you have any anointing without the genuine experience of salvation, your anointing is counterfeit. And at last, you will find yourself wanting before the holy throne of God. Brethren, who are these laborers? I will give you seven characteristics by which you will know. And by which you can measure yourself whether you are one of them or not. One, the laborers are people who are totally commit, I mean, comforted, totally comforted and fully dedicated. Totally comforted, that is what I'm emphasizing. 
totally confirmed. Don't be surprised if you get to hell and you see pastors. Don't be surprised if you get to hell and you see ministers, prophets in hell. The laborers are people who are totally comforted, fully dedicated, dedicated to the glory of God. Dedicated, 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 number two. Laborers are people who are ready to suffer any and every hardship. Laborers are people who are ready to suffer any hardship. They are ready to suffer every hardship in order to save a soul. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. Second Timothy chapter 2 I'm reading verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. People that are ready to endure hardness. You know why some people fall? You know why some people cannot maintain Christianity? You know why some people cannot go on? It is because of hardness. Hardship. You will say, well, things are so tight now. At least I have to do something about my life. And then the devil will send, will send somebody to him or her. And tell him, this is what you can do. And immediately the person falls into the hands of the devil. But laborers are people who are ready to suffer every hardship in order to save a soul. They don't mind going to prison in order to save a soul. They think about Jesus. What Jesus did. What are we going to do that will be equal to what Jesus did? He said, there is no man who can love better than this. That he will lay down his own soul for his own friends. This is what he did for us. What have we done for him? Brethren, laborers are people who have renounced and I want you to listen to this very, very carefully. They are those who have renounced even the legitimate pleasures of this world in order to satisfy the heart of the master. I'm not talking about sinful pleasures this time. I'm talking about legitimate pleasures. They renounced these legitimate pleasures of the world in order to satisfy the heart of the master. They don't have time to be idle. No time to play. They want to spend every minute in the work of the master. They hardly sleep. They don't have time to watch television for one hour. They don't have time to watch VCD, video, for two hours. They don't have the time to waste. They want to be up and doing in the service of the master. You know what I'm talking to you? They are legitimate things. But these laborers, they always talk about time. They know divine timing. They are urgent. They know that the trumpet can blow at any time. There is no time to waste. I want to ask you, are you like that? Are you like that? There are some of you who sleep for eight hours every day. Eight hours every day. And may I tell you, if you are fond of sleeping for eight hours every day, it means 
you spend one third of your life sleeping. If you live up to 60 years, that means you have slept for 20 years out of your own lifetime. So you are not awake. You don't know what is going on in your world for 20 years. Within the 60 years, you live. That means if you live up to 75 years of age, you have spent 25 years sleeping, not knowing what is going on around you. Brethren, they don't have much time. They know they don't have much time here. So, laborers are people who have renounced even the legitimate pleasures of this world in order to satisfy the art of the master. You know what the people of the world call them? Crazy people. Mad men. Because they are mad for God. The Fibrina said, let me burn out for God. Let me tell you, your life is a candle. And the light has already been set on it. Whether you like it or listen, when you light in a candle and you put it somewhere in the room, even when you close your door and you go out, the candle keeps on burning. Even when the candle is useless, it's not useful, not serving anybody, the candle keeps on burning. Listen, yesterday is gone and gone forever. Today is here, today is already going. And tomorrow we soon come. On and on and on and on and on. People who don't think very deep. They celebrate their body. Oh, praise God. I'm 30 years of age. You don't know one thing. I'm not saying you should not celebrate. But listen and listen carefully. By the time you say you are 25 and you are rejoicing, heaven is money on you. Do you know why? You keep on adding the number of your years here. Yeah? Up there, they keep on subtracting. They keep on subtracting. Each day you wake up, you are getting closer to eternity. And the day is coming. That day will be the final day. Listen to me. One happy new year will be celebrated and you will not be in the church. And you will not be at home. They will ask, where is this person? They will say, well, he's gone. A day is coming when other people will wake up, you may not wake up. A day is coming when the obituary of somebody will be out and your name will be written on it. A day is coming when a coffin will be brought into the town. And everybody will be crying. No matter the age, when somebody dies, people must cry. But a day is coming when your coffin will be brought into the, into the town. And people will keep on crying. And they will mention your name. Now listen to me. Because of that day, whatever you want to do, now is the time. Tomorrow is not your day. Forget about it. Yesterday is gone. Forget about it. Make use judicious use of today because today may not come again. Brethren, laborers are people who have renounced even the legitimate pleasures of this world in order to satisfy the heart of the master. 2 Timothy 2 verse 4 No man that worried entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to read verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Do you know why some Christians don't do you know why some Christians don't watch television? Please don't blame them. Do you know why some Christians don't even buy television? Television is a time waster. 
if you are not careful you can sit before the television for three hours watching watching the devil has given you a work to do watch it when you should be out evangelizing even some people will not even pray they keep on watching television till midnight that is why some people call it devil's box though it is not devil's box per se but the program can tie you down that even your eternity may be forgotten brethren he said that we not be brought under the power of anything go to the cyber cafe and browse you browse from 10 o'clock in the evening till 5 o'clock in the morning what are you browsing what are Christians browsing today internet pornography internet pornography and look at computer computer has come to do a very very good work in our lives but do you know the Christian life of so many people have been completely disorganized and bastardized by the computer there was a day I paid a visit to an elder of the church and he was telling me pastor I'm backsliding I said why and how do you know he said I don't I don't search the scriptures anymore everything I need I go to the computer now and I said one day is coming when some Christians will begin to think that computers should be praying for them brethren thank God for the advancement of technology but if we are not very careful the advancement of technology will erode away all the substances of Christian faith and look at what is happening in the churches today we have so many empty barrels from the pulpit to the pew everything has become so artificial so superficial Christians that are serious and are very scarce we have psychedelic Lacadisica Christians, soft pedale ministers who will not who will not tell you the truth to the point of death. Brethren, who are these laborers? These laborers are people who are ready to go anywhere, hit anything, live any hour, and sleep anywhere for the sake of the gospel. William Booth, many years ago, he said, Give me 100 men who are ready to sleep anywhere, eat anything, or, no, or not even eat at all. Who are ready to go anywhere for the sake of the master. And he said, Within two years, we shall conquer the world. He said, Give me 100 men. Who can go anywhere, eat anything, sleep anywhere, suffer anything for the sake of the gospel and give us two years. Within those two years, we will conquer the world. Where will he get those hundred men? He's looking for laborers. He's looking for laborers. Brethren, laborers are people, number five, who are willing to abandon their work for the sake of Christ though they may not be asked to do so but if they are called to do so they are ready to abandon their work for the sake of Christ number six laborers are people who are ready to forsake and forego their own plans for the sake of the perishing they are ready to forsake and forego their own plans for the sake of the perishing. John chapter 21. I'm reading verse 15 to 17. So when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than this? John 21, 15 to 17. 
I read again. Simon, son of Jonas, not first thou me more than this, he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, he said unto me, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? He said unto him, Ye Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. What was Jesus trying to tell Peter? Peter, you have your own ambition. You have your own pursuits. You have your own goal for your own life. Forsake your own plan. Forsake your ambition. Forsake your goal. And now, feed my sheep. Do my pleasure. Do my will. I was reading Charles G. Finney one day and he said until Christians are brought to know, are brought to the point of knowing that without complete consecration they will never get to heaven. The church will not change. I repeat as Tiffany said until the church the brethren the Christians are brought to the point of knowing that without complete consecration, total commitment unto the Lord they will never get to heaven he said the church will remain the same what am I saying? Until you are fully committed to God, your name will never appear in the book of in the book of life. This kind of Christianity that we are practicing today, I wonder where it will take us to. I wonder what half baked pseudo Christianity will take you to. Christianity with insincerity. Christianity without frankness. Christianity without boldness to speak up for the Lord and stand for the Lord in the midst of his foes. That Christianity will take you nowhere. Brethren, these laborers are people who are willing to abandon who are willing to forsake and forego their own plans for the sake of the perishing. There are some of you, your father died without Christ. Your mother died without Christ. You know what happened? My father was 74 years of age when he died. He died in 1982. I was two years in the Lord by that time. There was a little fear of my father inside of me. That is one of my greatest regrets today. I never had the audacity to preach to my father before he died. He only knew that I was born again and he was persecuting me. But I, I, nev I never had the boldness to confront him because, you know, my father, you know, you know, you know Muslims, you know, you know what it means. I was the first person to be converted in the whole extended family. And there was war. I mean war. Battles. But the greatest regret of my life is that I never preached to my father. Now, when my father died without Christ, I lamented, I cried. I said, oh God, this is my mother. I won't allow her to die. She will not. I won't. I won't allow her to die until she confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
I kept on preaching to my mother, Mama, this Jesus is real. Who receive me? My mother will not reject it, but neither will he, will she accept it. My mother will just say, yeah, "That Jesus is a good Jesus. We will all serve him. Don't worry." I will also give my life to him. I have seen what he has done in your life now. Ah, if that Jesus can make you as soft as this, that Jesus must be wonderful. Don't worry. Wait for me. I will, I will catch up with that Jesus one day. He, she kept on saying that until she was 90 years of age. Now, I was tired. Then I was tired. I had to be sending people to go and preach to my mother. And you know what happened? To the glory of God, my mother confessed the Lord Jesus Christ ten days before her death. <laughs> and once she did that, she gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ through my wife. My wife went to preach to her. And she gave her life. Then I said, God, if you have done this, all right, you can take her away. And she was gone. Brother, what are you doing? Let me tell you something. If there is anybody in your family that is yet to be saved, you yourself are yet to be saved. As far as God is concerned. Because that, the blood of that person will be required from you. All those people you have the opportunity to talk to, and you never opened your mouth. When you bought a bus, you won't talk. You'll be afraid of people. Inside the bus, you won't talk. The fire in you is dying. You are fainting spiritually. And as you are fainting spiritually, let me tell you something. Your name is being blotted out of the book of life, little by little. So don't be surprised. If there is no fire in you, there will be no magnet to pick you up on the day of rapture. That is why I'm calling you now to get a place for God and get ready to die, if need be, for the sake of the gospel. Brethren, laborers are people who are ready to die any time, if need be, to bring many children into glory. To die any time. Thank God for long life and prosperity. They are good things. They are part of the promises of God. But laborers, these fully committed, dedicated people, they are ready to die any time. They are ready to jeopardize their lives for the sake of the gospel. Any time. In fact, remember Paul said, I die daily. Do you know what that means? I face death every time. And I'm ready to go any time. Can we now see why they are few? The laborers are few. Look at the qualification. Look at the traits of their lives. Look at the fine expectation. Laborers are few because only very few people are willing to surrender all. Oh, we may be singing. God won't mind us. I surrender her. When you have surrendered nothing. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy of the highest degree. Many of us are after what God will do for us. We are not after what we want to do for him. We are interested in getting and not in giving. Having forgotten that the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Since you said you are a Christian, what have you done for him? Okay, let us imagine that the trumpet blows tonight and you are fortunate to go in the rapture. When you get to the gate of heaven, and you go inside. If an angel asks you, where are your comforts? How many people will you point to? Let me tell you something. 
those of you who have brought people to the Lord Jesus Christ, it was in your early days of Christianity that you did this when the fire was still burning. But now knowledge has increased. You know more Bible now. You can now pray in tongues. Because of this experience and knowledge, can you imagine? The fire is dying. Many of us have replaced knowledge with experience. And that is why we no longer care about winning people for Christ. The laborers are few. The laborers are few. Very, very few. Now, before we close, I will talk to you on the perils of the lukewarm. Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 15 and 16. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Look here. Do you know what God is saying here? That you are not cold, you are not hot. You are not a Christian. You are not a sinner. You stand within the gap. You stand in between life and death. You stand in between heaven and heart. Because you are disturbing God. God is saying, When I see you, I feel nauseated. You are nauseating and disgusting. God says, I'm ready. You, you want to make me vomit. I will vomit you out. And that is what God is saying. Because of lukewarmness. Lukewarmness we land us nowhere. Apart from the lake of fire. Carelessly sitting down. And warming the bench. Year in, year out. Why millions perish in sin? We only attract defined judgment, defined displeasure. There is no place for the indolent in the kingdom of God. There is no place for the nonchalant in the kingdom of God. There is no place for pleasure loving believers. In the kingdom of God. The fruitless tree has to be cut down. The lethargic and the carefree Christians will find themselves wanting before the holy throne. Must you meet him empty handed? The reward of the faithful is great. Will you pray that God will make you one of his laborers. There are few people that God is delighted with. There are few people that God is happy with. Will you pray like that composer? You know what he said? That composer, you pray like him today. He says, Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to the listen. All these things we have come to do here, they are not an end in itself, they are means to an end. He said, Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move. At the impulse of thy law, take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice, let me sing. Always only, always only. I won't sing the songs of the world. I won't copy the songs of the world. Take my voice. Let me sing. Always. Only for my king. Take my lips. 
Let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold. I wonder how much you give as offering your church. Not a might will lie with old. Take my intellect and use every pass thou shalt choose. Take my will, make it die. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At thy feet, a treasure stone. Take my say, and I will be ever, only, all for thee. Shall we rise?